Welcome to the Fed Life Podcast with Dan Seip from Serving Those Who Serve. In this podcast, Dan draws from years of financial experience to help federal employees overcome challenges that every Fed can relate to. Join us for this journey as we reach, teach, and serve to help you make the right financial decisions. Now, on to the show. Hello, Feds, and welcome to this episode of the Fed Life Podcast. I am, as I always have been, your host, Dan Seip. Additionally, I'm the branch manager here at Serving News, Serve, and Lee Seip and Associates. And I will begin as I always do. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen. And above all, thank you for your service. You do not hear that enough. You will always hear it here. We are back again today, continuing remotely, with the incomparable, the guru, Ed Zerndorfer, as part of our ongoing mission to reach teach, and serve you. And you can help us with that by letting folks know about the podcasts, letting folks know about our webinars. If you don't know about them, check them out. We'll be touching on that a bit later. Pass the word around, folks. The more you do it, the more people we can help. And at the outset, I have to say the opinions of our guest, Ed Zerndorfer, are not the opinions of Raymond James or Serving Those Who Serve, although we think they're pretty great. This podcast is presented for information only and not intended to be taken as advice. All listeners should consult their personal advisors before taking any action. As we always like to do, these podcasts will mirror Ed's Fed Zone articles, which you can find at blog.stwserve.com or fed-zone.com. And today, we continue in a mid-career vein. So this is not just for the folks that are five years away from retirement. Uh, I know we typically do a lot in the pre-retirement pre arena, but I think you will see that pre-retirement actually begins a lot earlier than folks might think it would. And so, so Ed, I guess for starters, why don't we touch on what you think constitutes mid-career? Sure, Dan. I consider mid-career an employee who has between 10 and 20 years of federal service. That would okay. be a good starting point. Okay. So um, in your first three articles in this topic that, that we're going to kind of squeeze together here because they cover a lot of the same stuff, you know, one is for uh, FERS and one is for CSRS, uh, and it, they cover making deposits uh, for retirement. And I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it so our folks can hear it. Uh, why do you think making a deposit is a mid-career activity for something that someone did earlier that could count for their retirement? Why do you think that's mid-career as opposed to just wait till the end and do it? Uh, the main reason is that uh, if somebody makes that deposit for temporary service or for military service, they make that deposit they could end up retiring earlier than expected. Here they worked, let's say, 30 years, um, and, they, and they found out in the 29th year that they intended to work 30 years, and they find out in year 29 that they had three years of temporary time they could have um, made a deposit for, and if they would have made that deposit, they could have retired, let's say, three years earlier than expected. Also, mm -hmm. by making that deposit as early in their career as possible, they will uh, minimize the amount of interest out charges they have to pay to make that deposit because you have there a certain is. amount of time to make that make that deposit to make that deposit and not be charged interest, which really hurts. Gotcha, absolutely, and and I I know where you come down on paying unnecessary interest. Uh, you know, basically, don't do it. Uh, so, Article One and Two cover making deposits for military service and for temporary service under FERS and CSRS, okay? So I think our listeners all would out of the gate understand military service, you know, they served and just didn't stand long enough to retire. But can you give some examples of temporary service? Sure, uh, somebody served in the Peace Corps, somebody served in VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America, or somebody had a summer job at, at one of the national parks, they worked over the summer. Uh, maybe they had a they were they were work in a work study program. They were in school, and in the afternoon they worked for a federal agency. Um, as a so-called temporary employee, you're being paid, but nothing is coming out of your paycheck uh, to go into any retirement system. You're mm -hmm. getting uh, vacation time, um, but other than that, you're really not accruing any benefits by being a temporary employee. 
Okay. So mid-career folks listening to this, hopefully some light bulbs are, are popping on for some of you going, hey, wait a minute. I, I worked at a national park every summer and, and you know, I, I, I did that all through all through school and holy mackerel, I've got I've got four years of three months. Hey, that's a year. So what you're saying is they're going to be able to make a deposit and pick up that year on their retirement. That is correct, Dan. You know, Dan, it's just, it, it happened. I've done many, many retirement seminars over the years, and I talk about about these deposits for, temp, for prior temporary service. And invariably, most people, um, are, the attendees, they stare at me saying, I didn't know that. Absolutely. You mean to tell me I can, I can get credit? I can get credit for that time I worked as a temporary employee, and as a result, I could retire earlier than expected? And there's also another benefit. Um, in computing your CSRS or FERS annuity, one of the factors that is used to compute your annuity is your years of service. You have more years of service, you're going to end up with a larger starting CSRS or FERS annuity. Mm-hmm. Well, by making a deposit for your temporary time, you get credit for those years, not only for eligibility, and everyone should note this word, eligibility to retire. You could retire, you're eligible to retire earlier than expected, but also in the computation, that's the other word, in the computation of your annuity, you're going to get credit, which means you're going to end up with a higher starting annu- annuity. For getting for making a deposit for that temporary time. Okay. So, so it's, 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 it's a tremendous it's, it's, it's a ter- tremendous benefit. Oh, couldn't agree with you more, because most of the time those jobs weren't paying as much as people are making at the end of their career. Not even close. So, so let's dig into the deposits a little bit. So, what are the rules and and what type of percentage of those small wages is a first person? looking at having to pay back? Well, let me just mention that if you're a FERS employee and you had any temporary time before, and it had to be before January 1st, 1989, unless you were in Peace Corps. Peace Corps has no um, time time restrictions here. But if you had any temporary time other than, 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 um, than, than Peace Corps, or VISTA, I should say, um, and it was before January 1st, 1989, you're, you're eligible to make a deposit for that temporary time, and that deposit is equal to 1.3% whatever your wages were, your total wages, um, at, uh, while you were a temporary employee. So suppose back in the early 80s, you had temporary service, you worked three summers, and your total um, wages for the three summers was a thousand dollars, thousand dollars. So your deposit would equal one point three percent of a thousand dollars, which I think, correct my <laughs> math, you know, is what is that about thirteen dollars, Dan? If I'm correct. Yeah, you're, yep, you're spot on. Yep. Thirteen dollars sounds yes. sounds it yep. doesn't sound much. And if it, let's say you work two months over the summer for three summers, that's six months. That's a total of six months. So the person's going to say, well, what is that going to do for me? Well, um, uh, if you have have the age, that means that you could actually retire six months earlier than expected. Mm -hmm. And also your annuity, your FERS annuity, will be a half a percent of your high three average salary more for how long? The rest of your life. Yep. I hope I'm turning on some light bulbs here for people that, you know, you got to remember, $13 is not a lot of money. And by the time you retire, you might have a high three average salary, let's say, let's say $100,000. Well, a half a percent of $100,000 is what, $500? Mm-hmm. You're going to get an extra five hundred dollars a year for the rest of your life by paying this thirteen dollars. Now there will be interest. We'll talk about that in a moment. But yep. I, I, Dan, I don't know of any places where you can invest thirteen dollars and get a guaranteed return of five hundred dollars a year. If you do, let me know, please. No, nope, I haven't been able to find it. And, <laughs> and folks, one of the things I'll touch on with the interest, and this is where you really want to go back to the Fed Zone 
and and look at Ed's Ed's articles because he's got all the tables in there because they do vary through the years. And so I'm not we're not going to put you through uh, hearing what it is year by year, but it's a combination of that principle plus the interest. And then when so the first person they're listening to this, the light bulb goes on. They go, "Hey, I have that time." Okay, how do they go about doing that? How do they go about making the deposit? Okay, um, let me let me just say this before I give you the actual form number, Dan. Okay. That as far as the interest is concerned, if a FERS employee makes that deposit for temporary time within the first three years of his or her hire date as a permanent employee, there'll be no interest charges. Now, I have to tell you, Dan, I'm the type of guy that doesn't want people to pay more than they have to. Sure. And one of, my, one, of the, one of the biggest disappointments I have in life is that when a FERS employee is hired, or a CSRS employee was hired, that um, their, their HR office or their personal office does not mention to them, oh, we noticed that you had some temporary time early in your career. Are you yep. aware of the fact that you can make a deposit for your temporary time? Tell the employee right away. And the reason I'm saying that is if that employee says, yes, I'm very interested in making that temporary time, then the employee will uh, download the form for, for FERS to make a deposit, and that form is standard form SF, standard form 3108, that you can find at www.opm.gov slash form SF, standard form 3108, Fill out as much as he or she can, give it to their personal office, and personnel will send it up to OPM, and OPM will do all the calculations as far as how much the person owes in the deposit. And again, if that deposit is made within the first three years of the person's hire date, there's no interest charges. It's been my experience that somebody who's in mid-career or getting close to retirement finds out about this deposit, and by that time, they, st they still can make their deposit, Dan, but they owe a, they owe a ton of interest. Yep. yep. This $13 deposit, if the person is now 30, let's say, 30 years into their career, they can make that deposit, but that $13 now is going to $500 with the interest charges. Yep. That hurts. That really Indeed. hurts, Dan. Okay, so listeners, listeners, we're deputizing you. Ed, Ed and I are deputizing you now. So as you're just, uh, you know, when you're back in the office, and we will be back in the office one day, if if you know there's somebody who's who's just joined your your agency and you're having a conversation with them and say, hey, I just listened to this. Uh, did you have any temporary time, you know, Peace Corps, you know, uh, things like that? And if they say yes, say, okay, you need to go talk to personnel right now and and talk about making that deposit. So I, I, I have to admit, I have to admit, Dan, this stuff is not easy to understand. But I do talk about it, and now I'm going to make a plug with your permission. Absolutely, because we have a FERS webinar. That we do. That's good. The next one I have the date is September eighth, two thousand twenty. Mm -hmm. And and anybody interested? Because I do talk about these deposits for, for 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 both temporary time and for military service during the webinar. Um, you can sign up by going to www.fed-zone.com. The first webinar will be on September 8th, and if you are happen to be C CSRS or uh, service officer, because we're going to talk about temporary time for for those employees too here in a moment. That's coming up. Your next. webinar is on September 2nd, 2020. Okay, so we can and we're going to talk about those deposits. I'm making a plug now, Dan, for the webinars. That's that's fine. And and folks, if you happen to hear this after the webinar date, do not fear. Still go to the website because we have these on a rolling cycle. We have we have a suite of eight of them, and as soon as one drops off, another comes on. So we are we are set up to keep this going. So if somebody shares this with you, it's like, oh no, I missed it. No, you didn't. You just might have to wait a little bit before the next one comes on, but you can jump right on and do that. So, good segue, Ed, talking about CSRS and offset. So, assuming the the temporary service categories are pretty much the same there, you know, worked in a national park, was a congressional intern, those types of things. 
but I'm guessing the deposit might be different? Uh, the deposit is the amount that you have to make for your deposit for if you, uh, if let's say you were hired as a CSRS employee general or somebody who was hired as CSRS um, came into federal service before January 1st, 1984. They were hired as a permanent employee, but prior to their being hired as a permanent employee, they had temporary service, let's say, uh, in the 60s, early 70s. Um, late seventies, what have you, um, and they had some temporary service, and they they ha- and they they can make a deposit for their temporary time. Also, um, um, they, their deposit is equal to seven percent of whatever their earnings were as a um, as a um, temporary employee. Uh, and then there's also interest charges that if they're not paid within the first three years of the higher of their higher date as a permanent employee, they will apply. Um, but uh, as we're going to find out here in a moment, it's a little more complicated with CSRS and service offset people than it is with FERS. Okay, mm-hmm. we're going to okay. find out here in a moment because it's so you've got that deposit, and and you'll have the interest. So let's talk about the forms. You know what makes it more complicated. All right. If you are a SERS or SERS offset employee, and you are, and you had prior temporary time before you got hired as a as a as a as a permanent employee, uh, you need to download form SF standard form two eight zero three SF two eight zero three at www.opm.gov slash forms. Now I said it's a little more complicated, and here's what it comes down to. If a CSRS employee or serves offset employee was hired before October 1st, 1982, mm-hmm. and prior to their being hired as a permanent employee, they had temporary time. So we have Joe, who was hired as a permanent employee on, let's say, uh, August 1st, 1980. That's when he was hired as a temporary. But Joe had some temporary time back in 1973. He worked a year as a temporary employee. Well, Joe, it can it can make a deposit for that temporary time. But let me just say this: actually, Joe does not have to make a deposit for that temporary time in order to get credit both for eligibility to retire and for the computation of the CSRS annuity. The rule is this, that if you were hired as a CSRS employee, a permanent employee, before October 1st, 1982, and prior to your hire date, you had some temporary time, temporary service, just like Joe here, you're getting credit, and please note these words, Dan, you're getting credit for as far as the temporary time, both for eligibility, eligibility, to retire, and in the computation of your CSRS annuity. You do not have to make a deposit to get that credit. However, if you do not make that deposit for your temporary time, then when you retire, your CSRS annuity will be reduced by 10% of whatever you owe for that temporary time. What do you owe for your temporary time? 7% of whatever you earned as a temporary employee plus interest charges. Gotcha. You always get credit for eligibility. You will get credit for computation, but if you don't make that deposit, you're going to owe, your your annuity is going to be reduced. Now, let's back up here. We talked about FERS. Under FERS, if you had temporary time, the only way you will get credit for both eligibility and in the copy and for, the, for your temporary time and and the temporary time being used in the computation of your FERS annuity is you must make a deposit. This is different for CSRS. Why is it different for CSRS? I don't know. I don't make the rules. Gotcha. There is another complicating fi- uh, factor here for CSRS and service office employees. If you were hired 
after uh, between, uh, after September 30th, 1982. Yep. As a permanent employee. And you had some prior temporary time. That temporary time will count for eligibility, no matter you, whether you make a deposit or not. But in order for that temporary time to count for computation of your annuity, be included in the computation annuity, you must make a deposit. No deposit, no credit for computation. Got There's it. a cutoff date of October 1st. Again, this is complicated. We know that, Dan. And I well, talk absolutely. about this. And I will talk about this at the CSRS webinar on September 2nd. So if you are SERS or SERS office employees and you think you may have had some temporary time, I plead with you, please attend a CSRS webinar. If yep. not in September, we're going to have another one in October, right, Dan? Or in November. We have them every yep. month. Exactly. Please. It's very important that you're aware of this. There's another thing that people should be aware of, the employee should be aware of. If you're a serious or serious office employee, when you get your annuity estimate, you're within three years of retirement. On your annuity estimate that you get from HR, it'll show on that annuity estimate if you do, in fact, owe a deposit for temporary time. Mm -hmm. It shows up. It says, deposit, CSRS deposit, pre-October 1st, 1982, or post-September 30th, 1982. That is not done for FERS employees. Why not? I don't know. All I can say is, ladies and gentlemen, who are listening, whether you're CSRS or FERS employees, you should be aware of this. Because there are few people in the federal government that know all the rules when it comes to temporary time. HR Very is confused, true. too. Yep. You have to be aware of this. The earlier you make that deposit, the less interest you're going to have to pay. I know most people would love to retire earlier than expected. Sure. I know Everybody wants to get a higher annuity. Yep. So why would you not want to make a deposit if you can? I can think Makes of some reasons, which we'll talk about here in a moment. Okay. Um, okay. So, so what would be the reason? Because because I know, and actually, Ed quizzes us on these things, and and I know basically the only place where he says it depends has to do with CSRS and CSRS offset. So what might be a reason that a SERS or SERS offset might not want to make the deposit? Um, under the rules for SERS and SERS offset, when you reach 41 years and 11 months of service, um, I'd like to say you maxed out your CSRS annuity. Uh, you won't get any, any more credit for working any longer. Actually, you will. Uh, you will get some. You will. You will get. A, you'll. You will be able to get that money that's been taken out of your paycheck to go into the CSRS retirement disability fund. Will actually be used. To, you can be used to buy you another annuity. But the fact is, when it comes to your regular annuity, your CSRS annuity, um, you would get eighty percent of your high three average salary plus uh, and, uh, any unused sick leave will be converted to time, and that'll be added to your annuity. But here's my point. Somebody who works beyond 41 years and 11 months will continue to have 7% of their paycheck going into the CSRS Retirement Disability Fund. Now, if that person had some prior temporary time, let's say they were hired at this point before 1979. Do my math here. It's, it's 2020. Somebody has 41 years, 11 months of service. They were hired in 1979 as a permanent CSRS employee. But let's say back in 68, 69, two years, they had temporary time. That person probably does not want to make a deposit for their temporary time uh, because if they're going to continue to work past this, past this year, that is the, the money being withheld from their CSRS, um, um, uh, pay, uh, from, their, from their paycheck, will be used to make that deposit. Will be, the OPM will apply that, that, that 7% coming out of their paycheck towards their deposit. 
which means, in effect, that they won't owe anything by the time they retire. So that would be one category. Another category, another category is somebody who may not want to make that deposit is somebody, let's say, who's single um, um, and uh, they're not going to give a survivor annuity and they're very sickly and they don't expect to live more than 10 years after they retire. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, if you don't make that deposit, OPM is going to reduce your annuity by 10% of what you owe. Um, it, it, if you make that deposit, you get your money back in 10 years. But if you mm-hmm. die within the 10 years, then you won't get your money back. So somebody like that may not want to make that deposit if they, if they don't really expect to live 10 years after they retire. I hope, God willing, that doesn't happen to anybody, but there are some people like that who are just... You know, they're they're let's say they 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 could be well in their seventies, eighties, and they and they just don't they don't they're not expecting to live that long after they retire. Gotcha. So that would be gotcha. two 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 possibilities of somebody who may not want to make that deposit. Okay. Now let's pivot and talk about the uh, the military service deposits, and I think everybody kind of understands what we're talking about here. You you served in the armed forces and you did not retire you can buy that into your federal service. So, Ed, why don't you talk about how they can do that? Um, If you had active duty military time um, and um, you're not a military retiree for active duty, now, if you are a military retiree for active duty and you want to buy back all your military time, you're going to have to waive your military retirement check um, and buy back all that time to get credit for that time as far as federal is concerned. That's generally not a good idea, but there are some exceptions, mm-hmm. and I bring this up during the also during the webinars. But let's suppose somebody only had, let's say, five, six years of that, or maybe three, four, four five, you know, whatever number of years of, of, of active duty prior to being hired as a federal employee um, under CS arrest or FERS, um, they can make a deposit for their military service, and in so doing, they're going to get credit both for eligibility to retire. Those years are added, meaning they could retire earlier than expected, and also those years are used in the computation of their CSRS and FERS annuity. The mm-hmm. deposit is equal to 3% of your base pay while you work, total base pay while you're in the military, plus, again, interest charges if you do not make that deposit, the principal of 3% of your total base pay, within the first three years of your hire date. And again, Dan, I have a very, very sore point about this because when someone is hired into federal service and they had prior military service, in most cases, HR personnel knows this. So HR and personnel should it should suggest to this new hire that because they have prior military service, they are encouraged to make that military deposit within the first three years of their hire date, and in so doing, avoid paying those god awful interest charges. Sure, it never happens. I run in when I do retirement seminars. I have people in my class who have twenty, twenty five, thir- almost thirty years of service. And they say, I didn't know I could make a, I could make a, 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 a deposit for my military time. Well, you still can make it. Well, what do I owe? Three percent of my of, of whatever you your total base pay was. How many years of service do you have? Oh, I got about twenty eight years of service. How old are you? Well, I'm 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 fifty seven. Well, you realize that you know if you make that deposit, you make that deposit, you could retire. Because now you have now you have over thirty years of service. You got the age, or at least age fifty five, or minimum retirement age. You make that deposit, you could retire immediately and add three years to the computation of your annuity. What do I owe? Three percent of my of my of your military of military total base pay, plus interest charges. And when do the interest charges start? From the three years from the two years after you were hired. We got to go all the way back there, and the interest charges are compounded. Ouch! Yep. Ouch. It hurts, Dan. Oh, it I hurts know. when I when I have to tell this to a person. 
why weren't you told about this when you were hired to avoid these god awful interest charges? Well, uh, we're gonna we're gonna round out on this one with something that I know you think is a double ouch, and that is for the person who started in federal service, for whatever reason left, and then withdrew their contributions, and now they're back safely in the fold, and. They learn from an Ed Zerndorfer webinar, an Ed Zerndorfer seminar, or an Ed Zerndorfer podcast that first they should have left it in there, but if they didn't leave it in there, if they pay it back, they can have good things. So let's talk a little bit about that redeposit aspect. Yes, this is called a redeposit. Um, both CS Rest and FERS employees who were initially hired worked a number of years, but then left, and when they left federal service, they made the decision of withdrawing their CSRS or FERS contributions, and then they returned to federal service. They have the option of redepositing those contributions that they took out plus interest charges. And what is the deal here? Well, if they redeposit that money, they will get credit for those years for both eligibility and in the computation of their CSRS or FERS annuity. They get credit. Mm -hmm. It's a little more complicated for CSRS than it is for FERS. I want to mention that FERS redeposits um, only, only were allowed within the last 10 years. Before October 28, 2009, if a FERS employee withdrew his or her contributions and returned to federal service, this is before October 28, 2009, he or she could not make a redeposit. Mm -hmm. But then Congress changed the law, so effective October 28, 2009, a FERS employee um, can redeposit the funds he or she withdrew when they left federal service. And in so doing, they get credit both for eligibility and in the computation of their of their FERS annuity. CSRS, um, it's a little more complicated in the following sense that if you are a CSRS or service office employee and you left federal service before March 1st, 1991, and you withdrew your contributions before that date, then when you, you came back to federal service, whatever, whenever you came back, you're getting credit both for eligibility and for the computation of your annuity, you're still getting credit. That's the good news. You don't have to make a redeposit. You don't have to put that money back within and pay it back with interest. The bad news is if you don't make the redeposit, your annuity will be what's called actuarially reduced. And I talk about that, how they do that reduction in the um, Fed Zone column. Um, yep. um, I talk about the redeposit, how they do that reduction. If you withdrew your CSRS contributions anytime after February 28th, 1991, and then you came back to federal service sometime after, then you will get credit for the years withdrawn for eligibility purposes, but, the, but in order to get credit for computation purposes, you must make a redeposit Putting back the money, paying back the money you withdrew plus interest charges. In this Fed Zone column I wrote, I talk about these redeposits and give several examples to help the readers understand what's going on here. Whether it makes sense to make these deposits as well as redeposits, I try to write it so that you understand it, and then yep. um, and give you several examples to make it make it make it more understandable. It actually really, really, really goes into a lot of detail in those things. So even though you're listening to this, if you think you have a handle on it, make sure you buzz by the, uh, the Fed Zone to do that. And, and I'll just go ahead and, and say this for Ed. Uh, we actually had a fellow walk into one of, our, uh, one of our live seminars, and he said, hey, I had this many years in federal service, and it was enough that if he waits until he gets to his 60s, he could actually get a pension. And he goes, what... You know, what's my rate of return that I have to uh, get to be able to beat leaving that money in there? I'm thinking about taking it out, and it said, don't do it. Don't do it. Leave it in there. 
And you're going to be pleasantly surprised when you get out to your 60s what sort of pension that's actually going to generate for you. Now, you're not going to be in the health plan and all that stuff. Folks, it really is the best deal in town. So, you know, if, if you are thinking about leaving federal service, that's great. You can always pull the money later, but safe bet, not a bad idea to leave it in there. Wouldn't you agree, Ed? Oh, by, by all means. I, I plead with people. Leave the money there for two reasons. At the very least, if you, ha- if you have at least five years of service, you will get what's called a deferred annuity. Uh huh. But also, if you leave federal service, there's nothing stopping you from coming back. You could finish out your career, retire, and get your health insurance benefits throughout retirement. People mm-hmm. do that. They come to work for the federal government in their late 50s, early 60s, even 70s, work just a couple of years in order to get health insurance, the, the federal employees' health insurance, in which the government's paying 72 to 75% of the premiums for themselves and if they're married for their spouses. It is a tremendous deal. But you there have you go, to folks. just remember, please leave the money in the system. Yep. Yep. Okay, there you have it, folks. Sage guidance from the guru, indeed. Okay, once again, Ed, great stuff. Thank you so much. I I don't know how you keep on top of all this stuff, and I'm glad you do it with us, and I'm glad you do it for the feds. Folks, that is a wrap. Ed will be back as we continue with our ongoing mission to reach, teach, and serve you. We are serving those who serve. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast on our YouTube channel and Spotify. Please remember to to share it with your friends, strangers, throw it to a couple of enemies. Seriously, do something nice for them. Maybe they won't be enemies anymore. Uh, Check us out on Twitter and LinkedIn. Do not forget our live webinars. Ed talked about them. It is a full series. It's a full slate of eight. Uh, As a matter of fact, I think we're nine now, Ed, because we added one specifically on survivor benefits. So that will be on on the rotation. Uh, We're taking suggestions from people. and, And if it's a good one, we will build a webinar for you on it. Just go to the STWS website, which is stwserve.com. When that comes up, you'll see the red webinar button right in the front. You hover over it. It turns blue. Go ahead and click it. That will take you to the main menu. Uh, So it is virtual ed live. So there's actually dynamic live Q&A in there. They're going really, really well. We're getting great feedback on it. I think you're going to love them. So the guru will come to you. Yes, you can you can hear Ed wherever you are. You can be in your bunny slippers and you can hear Ed. So as we continue to reach, teach and serve you. So we work to reach you where you are, teach you where you are and above all, serve you where you are. Sign up for one, sign up for all, share the page with your friends. They will thank you. As Ed mentioned, read them every month in the Fed Zone at blog.swserve.com and also at fed-zone.com. So for Ed, the crew at Serving Those Who Serve, and me, Dan Seip, before I sign off, I will tell you that Ed and I, turns out we got nicknames because my, my son, my college-age son, uh, listened to one of our podcasts. And he goes, man, Eddie Z answers everything. He explains everything. And I said, wow, Eddie Z, that's kind of cool. And, uh, and I said, do I have a nickname? And he goes, oh, yeah, you're Danny Feds. <laughs> and I said, I said, okay, how come he sounds like he's a genius and I sound like I'm from Goodfellas? So at any rate, so we're going to sign off as Dan and Ed. We'll see if Eddie Z and Danny Feds catch on. So for Ed, the crew at Serving the Serve, and me, Dan Seip, good luck, Godspeed, and above all, and Jennifer Meyer, I know you're jumping on my tagline now in those webinars. Above all, remember, it's your Fed life. Make it a great one because you deserve it. Stay well, everybody. We are out. Thank you for listening to the Fed Life Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of serving those who serve or Raymond James. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. 
securities offered through Raymond James Financial Services Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Raymond James Financial Services Advisors Incorporated. Serving those who serve is not a registered broker or dealer and is independent of Raymond James Financial Services. Raymond James is not affiliated and does not endorse the opinions or services of any of the quoted professionals or their respective firms. Any opinions are those of Dan Seip and not necessarily those of RJFS or Raymond James. This case study is for illustrative purposes only. Individual cases will vary. Neither Raymond James Financial Services nor any Raymond James Financial Advisor renders advice on tax issues. These matters should be discussed with the appropriate professional. Investing involves risk and you may incur a profit or loss regardless of strategy selected, including diversification and asset allocation. Raymond James is not affiliated with and does not endorse the opinions or services of the quoted professionals or their respective organizations.